so from the vault is one of the i suppose one of the exhibitions of uh, the triennale stellenbosch triennale um and within the stellenbosch triennale we are looking sort of like looking at the past present and the future so from the vault is situated in the past because it's looking at the collections of two of the oldest uh, universities in South Africa, which is Fortier University and Stellenbosch University. Uh, and then the present is an exhibition called On the Cusp, uh, which looks at uh, 10 of the most exciting young artists uh, to emerge from the African continent. And then we've got the main curator's uh, exhibition, which looks at the present, which is looking at the big name artists uh, that are currently uh, practicing on the African continent. Um, for From the Vault, initially we wanted to look at the, uh, the collections, at art collections of uh, institutions, academic institutions and even corporates because we realized that we've got a lot of art that has been collected by uh, academic institutions and corporates like the SABC that are just sitting in the vault that nobody's really uh, you know, looking at. And there's some gems of some, some really beautiful and some important seminar artworks that are sitting in these vaults, but nobody really looks at them. So due to logistics um, and other issues, we ended up zeroing in on two um, collections, which is the Fortier collection and the Stellenbosch uh, University collection. And the idea here was really to put these two collections in dialogue with each other. If we look at these two universities, uh, historically they've been placed, uh, you could actually say they are parallel uh, universities. Their politics are parallel. Uh, Fortier University really the, the bastion of African nationalism, if you want to put it that way, uh, people like Robert Mugabe, Lent, um, Nelson Mandela, Oliver Tambo. On the, other, on the other polar opposite, you've got Stellenbosch University, um, which historically was seen almost like as the intellectual hub of uh, apartheid nationalism. So two different uh, or parallels, uh, parallel histories and ideologies of these universities. And now, we were tasked with looking at the art collections of these two universities. And um, I, I don't know if uh, Kokelo would like to jump in and start sort of like talking about how we went about, you know, navigating these two parallel histories. From the vault, you know, I can say we were asked to literally go into the storages of these two institutions and to be able to just like, I think firstly, it was just to look what they have in those storages, you know, um, and to bring out some of the things or some of the gems, like Mark was saying, Michael was saying, uh, bring them into the light as a way of just finding, creating our own map, basically, um, for the future. Um, but we got to have that privilege, I suppose, with the University of um, Stellenbosch, because University of um, Fortes in the Eastern Cape and and also I think I want to just bring it across you know how the University of Forte collection was such a it poses a challenge for us you know in the sense that our show was meant to go up first it was supposed to open first actually but it didn't and there was this thing for me, uh, I don't know if Mike had felt it like there was just this resistance you know um, it was kind of intangible in a sense. Everything was going up in other two spaces, the curator's exhibition um, on the cusp. You know, the artists were there like making works, like literally something was happening. You could tell that, you know, something is about to happen. And then on the other side of the Triennale, you, from the vault, nothing is happening, you know. And there was kind of this tension building up and and this kind of, you know, um, resistance and, and it was kind of spiritual for me in a sense that there was this thing that was holding everything back. And, and I think Kanye did mention it when we, when we opened and when she was speaking to um, University of Forte Vice Chancellor Sakele. And, and she said she yeah. felt like the ancestors were just not ready. You know, they had their own time. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, and I felt that. And when she said, like, oh, my God, that's exactly what I've been struggling with, you know, just to articulate it and say, this is what I'm experiencing, that it's not just a physical challenges of um, the weather, you know, they had floods, also student protesting. It was not just about that. There was something else that was spiritual, that was very strong. Um, for us to go into the story, we were summoning a certain energy, a certain presence, a certain time period, you know. So I think that on its own, you know, it, 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 we were confronted with this kind of intangible, unseen um, um, challenges, you know. But it was quite an experience. It was a learning, a huge learning curve for me. Um, we did go into the Stellenbosch um, University collection and and it was really, really, I suppose, a privilege again to go into an academic institution and to see what they have, because I think that's a rare opportunity uh, for, cur for curators, you know, um, to go into this um, academic institution and look into their collection. And, and yeah, so that was just like a beautiful experience. But another, when the photo collection was now, um, in the in the museum, you know, University Museum of Stellenbosch. For the longest time, we sat with the we had access to the Stellenbosch University collection, and we were waiting. The theme of waiting for the fourth year collection is really, I think, it's really big uh, in this exhibition because we waited for a long time, and then when the collection itself came, we had was it four days to put everything up together yes. or something. And it's quite interesting that when the fourth year vice chancellor came for the opening, he also intimated something along the way that when the call came for, uh, from the Triennale to mm. use, or from Stellenbosch University to use uh, the fourth year collection, there was this hesitancy from them to say, are we really included in this? Is this really going to be a dialogue? Or is this, you know, historically thinking historically, is this just sort of like that? Stellenbosch wanting to take the very best of, you know, uh, the African modernists artists that we have for use for this tree and other thing. They weren't really sure whether they were going to be validated as an equal mm. partner. Yeah, we, we waited a lot uh, for the Forte collection. And when it came in all its grandeur and beauty, we literally had four days to put everything together across four exhibition rooms. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I want, I want to ask Stephen, because you also, you know, you are probably one of the first people to work with the photo collection. And I just want to ask you, how was your, your first experience? Because for me, it was just beautifully overwhelming because I was like, you know, for the first time where you as a curator, you need to stop and listen to the object, you know, and, and just give it its respect that it's commanding. Well, firstly, let me just congratulate both of you on assembling a, a very, very memorable exhibition. And I'm so sorry that the lockdown intervened because I was looking forward to coming again and walking through the exhibition space with you and having some intimate interaction with the works. But um, we'll have to have this for now as a substitute. Yeah. So yeah. in 1988, um, I curated this exhibition, The Neglected Tradition. Um, this is the second oh, wow. edition actually oh. of the catalog. Mm -hmm. um, the first edition, I, I lent it to somebody. And when I went to, so, so you must just kind of also I think it's very hard for people who weren't around at that time to understand. I mean, you talk about the complexity and the difficulty of the engagement now between Fortier and Stellenbosch. Mm. You can imagine in the 1980s how, how difficult <laughs> yeah. and complex yeah. these engagements were. And um, I had... I, I was teaching at the University of South Africa at the time in the fine art and art history department. And in, an, in 84, 
I'd gone off to Soweto to set up an art school in Soweto so that students who were studying through UNISA could have uh, studios at the Funda Center and a library. Because in those days, of course, all the universities were closed to black artists. The only place where artists could train was at Fortair and then eventually uh, in, in Durban uh, at the university um, in Durban. So we, we set up this, this art school and uh, Matsumela Manaka, um, I don't know if you know Matsumela and I don't know if you know his book, but Matsumela um, was running the art center and he invited me to come and set up this institution. And in 1987, Christopher Till, who was the director of the Johannesburg mm -hmm. Art Gallery, invited Matsumela and myself to go and talk to him, to give him some advice as to how he could transform the Johannesburg Art Gallery. And we went and Matsumela said to him, well, it's very simple. Why don't you just do an exhibition on the history of black South African art? And we left and we waited to see what would happen. And then in 1988, it must have been in July of 1988, I get a phone call from Christopher Till to say they've run into some trouble, they've run into some problems. The curator <laughs> is having difficulties, is not managing to curate this exhibition and the exhibition has to open in November. Oh. Will I <coughs> make it's myself cool. available as the guest curator and come and help them with this exhibition? So I know you only had four days to hang your show, but we had three months wow. in which to curate for the first time ever in the history of South wow. Africa, a history of black South African art. And I mean, it was a great, it was a great um, experience for me, but because of the political times we were in, the first thing I had to do was to go and speak to the comrades in the UDF, and and my friends, you know, the people, Bill Ainsley and David Kulwane and people at the Johannesburg Art Foundation, mm. just to say, ask them if it was okay to do such a project. You know, the Johannesburg Art Gallery in 1988 was the venue for the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the founding of the city of Johannesburg. So it was very much a, a state Owned. It was a city-owned gallery, and it was very tied into apartheid. And of course, we know that previously the gallery was closed to black South Africans. So I did some consulting, and everybody said they thought I should go ahead and curate it. And so in three months, I curated it. And one of the things was to go to Fort Hare. And the Fort Hare, it was before they had built the De Beers Gallery. And the collection was in the most terrible, terrible condition. It was in offices and storerooms. I remember opening drawers and there was literally broken glass on top of prints in these drawers. And um, I did some research and selected some works, particularly the Dumiles, which obviously they have the most important Dumiles in the country. So I'm very pleased to hear that the university now is so caring uh, and protective <laughs> of the collector. I think it's, it's, it is, I think it should be, you know, because as Mike was saying that the Triennale, you know, is, you know, it's divided into the present, the future and the past. And um, our exhibition occupying, you know, that past. And as we were going through the collection and looking, and, and for me particularly having a, um, a fine art um, undergrad, it was so, I don't know how to put it, but it was just so interesting to find that 
there wasn't much of it, like the, what the contemporary artists are actually doing, you know, it was, it somehow comes from that generation, you know, uh, the Mark May, the, right now people are trying to, um, you know, break the boundaries or, or push the borders. But it was just a beautiful experience to work with this archive in a sense that it was telling us where we come from, who we are, you know, and having that experience and having that, you know, um, honor of actually working closely with the collection, you start to appreciate and, and understand um, even our, our contemporary um, artists, you know. But um, also the show was not necessarily so much looking into, you know, the histories of, of both um, institutions, but like I said, it was just to look at how can, what can we find? Um, in this, in both collections, you know, um, mm. you know, aware of these kind of larger histories, larger narrative, and and uncomfortable, um, you know, and perhaps even traumatic and and painful histories, um, but like Mike would say, suspend the histories of both institution and try to find new ways, I suppose, of talking about. Um, these collections, these institutions, but yeah, finding a way of basically carving a new path, a new direction, you know, as our ancestors we were trying to ask for them, you know, like uh, if they could open a, uh, they could give us a direction, I suppose, you know, as we maneuver the territories of, of Stellenbosch particularly. Um, so, so our curatorial process was, was based on the fact that we're not going to be regurgitating the past, um, but we, we're trying to find um, probably missed or, 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 or hidden, um, you know, now we can use basically to move forward. If if I can just intervene there, I think I think the curatorial process I could see it as a as a series of uh, intentional and unintentional interventions, because for me, firstly, we're intervening in the space. I mean, this mm. is Stellenbosch Univers uh, Museum, and uh, by extension, Stellenbosch uh, University. Um, that space comes with its own, you know, way of doing things. So things like, you know, it's a historical building. So it's a series of negotiations that we had to get into to get things like even, uh, you know, we had to bring the Stellenbosch Museum on board. We had to bring Fortier University on board. We had to bring Stellenbosch University on board. We had to bring the Stellenbosch Triennale on board. And all these three, four institutions have got sort of like slightly different ways in which they saw the, uh, the exhibition coming into being. So things like, you know, painting the walls were not just things that, that happened automatically. Like we want to paint the wall and then, you know, okay, you can paint the wall. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if, uh, Kelo, you could say something around the curatorial interventions and the curatorial processes and some of the negotiations that, mm -hmm. that, that, you know, that took place in, in curating the, the show. I was naive at the beginning because one thing when I was talking about the archive, in my mind I was just yeah. thinking about the collection. <laughs> and even though my you know my personal research is based on museums as archives, but I I suppose my kid, I mean we spoke about this how we didn't realize that we had to it was not just about bringing these two collections into a conversation, but also you know, having to intervene, I suppose, architecturally, you know, having to deal with this kind of, the building itself, which is very old um, you know, structures that you, that are making curation, I suppose, <laughs> very, very difficult. So the first thing that we had to do, or I suppose we had to engage with was to convince the museum stuff, you know, just a curator to say, we need a facelift. <laughs> this is a new show. 
Um, we want to create a new space. This is, a, I suppose, a new era as well for you as, as the institution, but also um, Stellenbosch. Go ahead, Mike. No, yeah, just, just to add on to that, I think, I think that negotiation, there was, a, there was something, I think, that, that sort of like allowed us to have that, uh, that confidence to, to ask for things that probably we normally wouldn't ask for because it's, at the same point, we are outsiders. So we are outsiders to Silenbosch Museum. We are outsiders to Silenbosch University. We don't work for either institutions. We don't work for Fortier. We are the Stellenbosch Triennale, which is this thing which is sitting in between Stellenbosch yeah. University and Fortier University. So yeah. I think some of the things that we were demanding were quite, sounded quite outlandish within a museum mm. context. You know, things like intervening and painting the mm. walls in that yeah. those bright colors when I don't, I don't, I can't even remember if the walls had been painted in the, in recent history. So some of these things were really, really, um, for lack of a better word, maybe even radical for the museum, but yeah. I think the negotiating process of curating and, um, and they actually ended up coming on board and being very supportive, which is really good. And I think it's part of the curatorial background stories that never uh, yes. get known or that never mm. get told once the exhibition opens because they, they are always foregrounded in the background. Mm. Yeah, so we had to kind of do that. I think that it's a very important aspect because, you know, I cannot speak about the show without having speak about those kind of small, um, I, I suppose, challenges that we, were, that we were confronted with, that having to make them understand that this is a new show, this is a new space. Um, we're trying to bring something new, you know, just to the conversation at large. For me, there was also being a curator in a museum, and then having other people coming in to tell you what to do, <laughs> it was also an obstacle in a sense, because I know this job, this is my house, this is my place, you know? So having to allow another person to tell them that, okay, we don't like the lighting, we don't like the floor, you know? How about we change things up just to make things look better, look fresh, and perhaps even attracting a new crowd, because we wanted to create a, when even the, the normal visitors, you know, um, the regular visitors of the University Museum wanted to come in, but experience the space in a completely different way, you know. Um, it was not really, and also curatorially, we didn't want to put up the works and, and, and separate them to say, okay, on that wall we have a forte collection, and then on this wall we're going to have a, um, Stellenbosch collection, but we blended them together because, as I mentioned, that even though these artists are coming from different, um, you know, university or academic backgrounds, but their way of making, you know, their mark making was very, very much similar, you know. Um, so we brought a lot of those kind of conversation about, you know, schools in which these um, artists were, were taught or trained from. Uh, through the way we kind of display the work and even the process, the method in which we approached um, that was to use a salon style, you know, which is uh, Stephen, you're very familiar with. Um, <laughs> uh, it was just, uh, again, to, to dissolve those boundaries, you know, um, to really like people start to look at the work differently and for people to have difficulty to identify George Pemba from uh, Joan Myro, for, or even Louis McCobella from John Myro, you know. Um, so we try to try to kind of blend and focus and just create one uh, visual board for somebody who's coming in. Um, it was hard, it was a lot of negotiation, not just with the stuff, but the work itself, like I said, we will put a layout for a day and, and then we'll feel like this is not a resolved um, layout we'll leave it and go home and come back. And then the next thing, we just feel like, okay, this painting does not even work today, you know, and then we'll take it out. So it does back and forth, you know, adding and removing um, of artwork. And for me, that process was very beautiful because it was not so much, um, you know, kind of a logical or an intellectual process. It was very spiritual where we literally had to listen to, to the works and say, okay, if Louis wants to be put 
you know, next to Baba. <laughs> Why not? You know, we do, <laughs> we do that. But, so it but, was kind of very, to, like, it was a ritual, yeah. Mike? I want to jump in and ask Stephen about maybe because you did research on the fourth year collection around, do you know how the fourth year collection was put together? Maybe ways of collecting there? Yeah, well, so, I mean, the person who was really the driving force of the collection was a professor in the anthropology department by the name of De Yaka. It, it is extraordinary that the, there was a kind of a global hunger and interest in the new art that started from the moment it emerged out of South Africa, and in the first instance, Johannesburg. But the interesting thing about De Yaga is that I think he comes to the art as an anthropologist. So he is interested in understanding the black subject, okay? And he, he realizes that, uh, and in a way, he's, he's obviously an enlightened thinker, that rather than going and going into villages and studying people, he, he looks at the art. But, and he acquires a collection and he, and he publishes a book. So he plays a very important role because he, that, that those images are disseminated to a larger public through the book that he publishes. What happens is that with, with the rock strip phenomenon, which leads to a very wide dissemination of art because they're making prints. Because they're making prints, they're able to reproduce multiples. And so the work can be disseminated much more widely. And I was amazed to discover that as early as the 1960s, the Pretoria Art Museum was acquiring prints from, from the Rockstrip Art Center. I doubt whether Stellenbosch collection had any art by black artists until very, very late. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't look at, at the dates, but I would guess that most of it probably happened in the 1990s. The, <laughs> the Johannesburg Art Gallery only had, when, when we did the eclectic tradition, they had a painting by Gerard Socorto, and that was about it. You know, so there was very, very little. In fact, the best collections were the Killy Campbell collection in Durban. And then the Durban Art Museum had, had a very strong collection and collecting policy um, and had quite a strong representation of, of black South African art. But I think Professor de Yaha is somebody who's worth, you know, investigating and doing further research and trying to understand his motivation and his influence on the institution of Fort Hare as to why he collected and, and, and what his reading was mm. of the works that he was collecting. I think that's an interesting point because I remember, you know, when we went into the Stellenbos collection and um, for some reason it, it felt like the show was for only, and, and yeah, it was only for black <laughs> artists, you know, um, because you recall directors like, oh, here's a, you know, a black artist. I'm like, we're not here to look for specifically a black artist. We're here to look for works, you know, but I understand it was probably coming from the fact that most of the, um, the two major um, exhibition spaces, the curator's exhibition and on the cost, uh, the artists were were all black, in fact, you know. So there was also that uh, misconception, you know, misconception on 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 our side, I suppose, when it comes to our show, thinking that we're only showing because the Forte collection only has black, you know, modernist um, artists. But that was not the case, you know. Um, yeah, I think somebody did mention that the Forte collection was part of the ethnography, Mike. Yeah. Don't you remember? Yeah. yeah. Yes. You got mentioned, so and, I'm also, hmm? and I'm also curious to hear the the DBS link because there's some there's something with the DBS link that I've that I've heard uh, quite quite often. Mm. Yeah. Well, then in 1988 they had 
you know, the discussion was going on that they were going to build this new museum as early as, as 1988. So uh, what, you, you'd probably be able to, if you go to the Brenthurst Library in Johannesburg, you'll probably be able to find documentation relating to that. That is interesting as to, you know, what they were doing and why they were there at, at that particular time. But yeah. I mean, of course, the issue of, I mean, the ethnographic framing of black art is still continues to this day. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been working on the Samuel Makunyani collection and in the Cape Town Museum, where is all the Samuel Makunyani? It all sits in the ethnographic collection in the social history collection, go and you look at the material, you go to the ethnographic collection and there, and there all this material sits. So the, the, these processes of transformation and change mm. are extraordinarily slow. The fact that it's taken Stellenbosch then another 30 years or more to bring in two young black curators, I mean, gosh, you know, things just seem to be so, and then it's, to me, it's so interesting that now you, you that your method and your looking kind of in a way concurs in interesting ways with what my looking was, because the exhibition I curated, it's not only black artists who were in the exhibition, there were white artists in the exhibition. And that was because you couldn't make sense of the history mm. without understanding that black artists and white artists, mm. even in those very troubled times, mm. worked together yeah. and had relationships of collaboration and cooperation. I still, I still think, I mean, if you look at the history of Poly Street, it's still written from a very kind of white orientation. You know, it's written through the eyes of Cecil Scottness. Mm. It's not adequately written through the eyes of the black artists and, and what it meant to them mm. and what their perspective was. And sadly, it's becoming more and more difficult to rewrite these histories because so few of the artists are still alive. Mm. But we'll have to go to the archive to try and reconstruct, you know, what, what, a black perspective was and what the black experience was of a place like Polly Street, because it was obviously a very, very different view. David Kulwani and the very important exhibition last year around David and the project around David helped to, you know, draw out some of these stories. Um, so there's a long way to go. Yeah. I'm, also wondering, I'm also wondering, Stephen, if you if you would be able to draw some parallels from from the exhibition itself, because we've got a Scottness in there, and I wonder if you could draw some parallels between him and some of the some black artists in the in the from the Vault exhibition. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I think I might have told you the story when I was there about Cecil Scottness. I was asked. Um, in the early 90s by Barbara Masikela, who was at Shell House working mm. with Mandela. I was asked oh, yeah. mm. to select some artwork for Mandela's office because the Shell company wanted to buy him a gift. And we assembled the collection and took some work up to his offices to show him. And Madiba chose two works. And they were both by Cecil Scottness. And Barbara Masikela was very irritated at that. She said, he can't just have two works by a white artist. He must have a black artist as well. And so we chose a work by Tony and Kotsi as well. So Cecil Scottness, um, I mean, he, he obviously has, an ex he himself, if, if you look at his own history, he graduates from university and he's about to have his exhibition, his first graduate exhibition. And um, 
the exhibition um, gets seen by um, Egon Gunther. Egon Gunther is also a very important person in the history of South African art. He runs a publishing house and a print studio, and he shows his work to Egon Gunther. And Egon Gunther looks at the work, which are paintings of still lives, and he says, what is this about? And he, show, he says, surely you can't be doing such Eurocentric art. And he shows him the prints. The, the, the story is, is, is dealt with in the neglected tradition by a, 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 an artist, a German printmaker, who had been influenced by African art. And Cecil Scottness discards his whole show and starts working in this completely new method, doing woodcuts. Um, and so all of that is kind of happening in this transitional time. And I, so he's looking at the art of Africa, and then he goes to Polly Street to work at this art center, and obviously to have encounters with living South African black artists, and the rest is history. So what is happening in that studio practice and, and the relationship between teacher and student and who is guiding who and who is leading who is, you know, part of the story. Because if you look at Sidney Kumalo uh, and you look at Isram Lachai, yeah. in particular, the sculptors, mm -hmm. because the painters continued to paint in quite a traditional way, but the real breakthrough happens with the sculpture and they bring in the, the brick clay and they start making these unseen sculptures and this unheard of work. And it, it, it kind of, it just takes the South African art world by storm and it, it starts this extraordinary, and, and you have this Ahmad Glossy group and so you, uh, Catanio and Villa and Cecily Sash is involved and Kumalo uh, and Luca Satoli is there as well. I mean, Luca Satoli is a very interesting artist who, who has a very, very successful career, supported by Gallery 101 very, very strongly. So there is something that is catalyzed at Poly Street in that moment, but I think that the the story is told. It's told with this kind of central figure of Scottness, but I don't know if that is sufficiently accurate. The show is divided into four themes. You know, you have meditation, you have um, healing, um, ancestral time future histories. So as you walk into the space, um, the first room is ancestral healing. And we put all the sculptures, most of them on the on the ground floor. Um, and we kind of created a some sort of a circle uh, to kind of, I suppose, sanctify the space to make it more sacred. Because um, we looked at the sculptures, there's Jackson Shongwani, um, you've got your Sydney Kumalos there and, and how we try to um, explain ancestral time, which is, I find it challenging um, to explain it. It's not happening as we know with as people who are living right now. There's something about it that's kind of interdimensional. Uh, there's something about it that's not linear, you know, uh, but it's sort of coming from all different directions. Yeah, no, no, I mean, the Rock's Drift, Art Center was, it's a mission station. Mm. So it was run by Swedish missionaries. Um, so there is, there is that dimension. I think there's also an interesting dimension that for the urban artists who were going to Rorkstrift, you know, to a rural place, um, 
I've, I've sort of, I spent quite a lot of time sort of trying to understand this relationship between if, if you live in the city and you go back to the rural areas and what those things signify, a journey back into a different kind of, of, of spiritual space as well. Because you're talking about all these histories and fragments and memory kind of as this resource and, you know, spiritual side of things what parts of the past are you muting and why and what is this time that we're in now that distinguishes what is relevant to remember and what might not be as useful? That statement, uh, what is our time, is, uh, is part of a, um, a larger statement that was made by Selbin Vusi, who was actually a fourth-year uh, graduate uh, artist himself, a brilliant scholar and brilliant philosopher as well. But I think we zeroed in on what is our time in relation to the rest of the Triennale in, in relation to the Stellenbosch Triennale itself, because this is a Triennale that is trying to intervene within Stellenbosch. Uh, and the theme of the Triennale is tomorrow there will be more of us. So if you look at uh, the Stellenbosch uh, art collection and the Fortier art collection, immediately the things that are of interest uh, the parallel histories, you know, Fortier is in uh, Alice, Stellenbosch is in, you know, Stellenbosch universities in Stellenbosch, differences between the ideological orientations of the universities certainly in the past, differences in terms of wealth, uh, Stellenbosch and Fortier. So what is our time? We've got all this past that we've got that is full of tension, that is full of parallels, that is full of sort of like dichotomies. And we look at these exhibitions and the easiest thing to do in four days is to highlight these differences. But then we're like, no, can we suspend these different histories? Can we suspend these different ideologies? Can we suspend African nationalism, apartheid nationalism, and really look at the work and try to craft these two collections into one collection that can speak to the overarching theme of the Triennale, which is tomorrow there'll be more of us. What does it mean that the, tomorrow there'll be more of us? Because we are trying to craft, we are trying to look towards into the future rather than into the past. This is what the Triennale is trying to do. I was really glad that the, um, this was picked up by the, both the vice chancellors of both universities, this idea yes. of now actually trying to use uh, the this exhibition in particular and the combination of both collection both collections in some kind of sort of like diplomacy of uh, to bring together the two universities uh, in crafting some kind of narrative towards the future because these are the oldest universities in South Africa over a hundred years old uh, that hundred years has been full of you know sort of like parallel ideologies, parallel ways of thinking, uh, sort of like a divided history. And the intention now is actually now to use art to say how do we use art as a diplomatic tool to bring together the two universities so that the next hundred years are quite radically different from the last hundred years. And art was the thing that really sort of like brought these two universities together. That's why the vice chancellor's found it uh, really, really important to actually attend the opening of the exhibition. That when Sel they had a retrospective for Selby and Busi at the Johannesburg Art Gallery, <coughs> and the exhibition was opened by Tabo Mbeki. He was the deputy yeah, president uh, then. Yeah, yeah. And then shortly thereafter, he makes his famous speech, I am an African. <laughs> So it's, yeah. th there's no question that the power of art and the artist to stir the imagination. And I do hope that, that your exhibition is not forced to come down because it seems to me that your exhibition has not managed to do its work properly, um, you know, through it being truncated through this, this time of contagion that we're living through. Yeah, if I can just add and, and maybe round up to, to what you said, I think the issue of access was really important for us. And that's something that actually came to us as we were waiting for, this, uh, for, for the fourth year collection, because some days we literally had nothing to do than just actually wait outside and wait. 
Uh, we are waiting for paint. We waited for a lot of things. <laughs> One day we have another separate conversation about curating the show only. So yeah. as we waited outside, we noticed that because the, the museum is actually situated within uh, the Stellenbosch University campus and students use the museum as a shortcut to get to uh, the hostels on campus. And we noticed that really none of the uh, young students were coming into the museum. This is a beautiful museum. It's an mm. old, it's a historical building, but there's no engagement between uh, young people in the museum. So this is a contemporary space. How do you get the young audience to come to the museum to actually say, can I, can I go to the museum? Can I, can I just go relax, chill, do my homework in the museum? Can I bring a date? Can I engage with uh, the very best of African modernist art that's in the museum? Uh, so Carla really also was an influence in, in trying mm. to, to intervene within the museum space itself, collecting different works from both collections. You can't really tell whether this is a white artist or a black artist because this thing is now a, a new form. It's a new sculpture. Yeah. So those old, um, uh, you know, uh, hang-ups around this is an African artist or this is a white artist or this is the Fortier collection or this is the Stellenbosch collection sort of like dissolve in the way that we hang the walls. So we also had a young audience in mind and I think uh, upstairs we created what we called a pause room. You can actually sit down, hang, pause, read a newspaper, uh, recollect your thoughts. But in there, there are really, really two stunning Gerard Sekotos uh, that are in there. So this opportunity for anyone, uh, it doesn't matter your class, it doesn't matter your race, it doesn't matter where you're coming from, but you can actually come, you have a business meeting if you want, uh, you have a social meeting, do a tutorial, mm -hmm. and you've got two stunning Sekotos uh, right next to you that you can take pictures and really just revel in. It was really important to us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank and, you. Um, uh, all the best. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela, Stephen. Thank you.